In a Nuzlocke, any Pokemon that faints is boxed forever, and you only get to catch the first Pokemon you find per area. But what if every single Pokemon in Sword was completely randomized? Could we make it all the way to Leon if every gym leader is guaranteed to have legendaries and mythicals? Well, we'd have to try and assemble a pretty strong team, beginning with our starter Pokemon. And considering my choices are Meltan, which can only evolve in Pokemon Go, Cutiefly, and the based Darumaka, there was only one real choice. And with its ability randomized into Parental Bond, we're already off to a great start. To stand any chance against the horde of legendaries we're about to fight, we need to hunt down a full team of six as soon as possible, starting with a Jang Mo'o on Route 1. And with the contrary ability, this thing's got the potential of being a monster. Yo, oh, it's such a bad financial decision, but I've gotta have it. Then on Route 2, I pick up a Trico with Beast Boost. Looks like Sonic's got competition in the speed department. I then move on to Route 3, where I'm immediately greeted by a Larvitar. It's got Anger Point, which isn't a game-breaking ability, but it's still a Larvitar. With a couple more areas to pass through before we get to face the first gym, I go to Gallarmine number 1, where I pick up a Wild Ponyta. It's got Psychic Surge, which complements its psychic typing perfectly. We then reach Route 4, where I pick up a Minchino, since it really seems to want to join the team. And so, with a full team of six, we've got to challenge the very first gym versus Milo, who starts out with a Calyrex. Wait, hold on a second, what type even is this thing? Turns out it makes a lot of sense, and this big brain rabbit is a psychic and grass type. So we've got an excellent matchup with Darumaka, and I'm just glad it wasn't something like a mana fate. Second out, Milo sends in a Butterfree, which we have a great matchup versus, except it's got Primordial C. This makes it so that neither player can use fire moves, completely invalidating my Darumaka, so I'm gonna have to swap out, sending in my Ponyta, and because this particular Ponyta happens to have Power Gem through the power of randomization, beating Milo is a piece of cake and we're ready to take on Nessa. But first, let me introduce you to this video's sponsor, Honkai Impact 3rd, a lightning-fast cross-platform ARPG with amazing-looking graphics. Look at this, this game is absolutely gorgeous. And executing combos to crush your enemies feels awesome. From Hoyoverse, the makers of Genshin Impact and the recently released Honkai Star Rail. The new 6.6 .6 update has oodles of new content like Teriri's Magical Quest and the Merry Market minigame where you can unlock all the new outfits for more customization than ever before. My favorite in the game has to be Hersher of Thunder's Nocturne Ablaze outfit, since her ultimate literally torches the opposition with a dragon. Now that's the stuff. But coolest of all is the new character Mistel, who with her Dreamweaver battle suit is one of the flashiest of all, pulling enemies into a dreamscape to haunt them with her Javelin of Death so more of a nightmare. But if you're looking for a more hands-on approach, look no further than Prometheus. With our new Terminal A 0017 battle suit, you'll have your enemies within your grasp in no time. All available now, and if you use my link and gift code in the pinned comment below, you can get 30 crystals, 2,888 asteroids, and one character trial card for free. Join the action now. Returning to our quest of trying to become the Galar champion, we now have to take on Nessa, who starts out with a shiny Mew. I start out incredibly scared of this thing until it shows me that it's got the random imposter ability, which is very fitting, but not very helpful for Nessa, since she now just has a Larvitar, which means I can easily swap into Grovile and take it out in one quad effective energy ball. This also gives us a special attack boost from Beast Boost, but we're not gonna be able to stay in when Nessa shows us a Zelf. I don't have anything on my team that's a great answer, answer to this thing, but at least Larvitar has a few dark moves to hit this thing super effectively. What I definitely wasn't expecting is for Zelf to eliminate itself by going for explosion and leaving Larvitar on just 3 HP, meaning I accidentally made a great decision swapping into the only Pokemon I have that resists explosion. We're not quite out of the woods yet though, since Ness's final Pokemon is a Gigantamax Kingler. And these Gigantamax Pokemon with moves that give them boosts or lower the stats of my Pokemon are going to be a huge problem. I swapped in Minchino here since Larvitar would have most certainly fallen, but there's no amount of HP that this Orenberry can heal that's gonna save me from the incoming Max Quake. And this right here perfectly demonstrates the colossal challenge we have in front of us. If we don't run into enough trouble from the Gym Leader's legendaries, their final Gigantamax Pokemon has a great chance of knocking out a few of our team members, so strategically using Protect is going to be a great asset throughout this run. Now because of Contrary, Jangmo'o does get 
a speed boost from the max strike, but it's not quite enough to let us outspeed, and a seed bomb barely does anything, so I'm gonna have to swap out this time into Edamame. This is a very risky play, since the max quake did boost Kingler's special defense, and if this energy ball doesn't take out the Kingler, we're definitely losing Grovile. But luckily, we pick up the KO, and with it, the second gym badge. Uh, Heracross, are you doing okay, bud? Naturally, if one's going to eat here, the obvious choice is the local cuisine. Obvious, right? It's also the only choice in the entire town, you dingus. Leaving Holbury, I move through the very creatively named Galar Mine number two, where I pick up a Litten that I can immediately evolve into a Guts Toracat. Then just before taking on Kabu, I can go to the Modestoke outskirts, where I find myself a Frostlass. Which I figured, since it's a fully evolved, pretty powerful Pokemon, would be an excellent choice versus Kabu. However, he instantaneously proves me wrong by sending in a Heatran, both of which stab is super effective against Frostlass, so I I'm forced to swap out into Toracat. And here I get Scary Faced, lowering my speed by two, meaning that I'm gonna be slower the next turn, and Heatran reveals Ancient Power, which with a critical hit leaves me at only one HP. And since my subsequent double kick barely does any damage at all, it leaves me with only one potential strategy to beat this thing. You might find it strange that I send back in Frostlass, but I figure she can probably take one Ancient Power and follow that up with a Destiny Bond. This will take out the Heatran guaranteed, but at the cost of my Frostlass, which is a steep price to pay, but it's way better than sacrificing most of my team in all likelihood. Not a great start to the fight, losing what's probably our currently strongest Pokemon, so I send in Darumaka as Kabu sends in a Regice, giving me an excellent matchup, and I do way more damage than I expected with a super effective Fire Fang, almost taking the Regice out. I do end up taking a lot of damage in return from an Ancient Power, but luckily the Regice doesn't collect the Omni Boost, and another Fire Fang takes it out, leaving Kabu with his final Pokemon, Gengar. Gigantamax Gengar is terrifying, regardless whether or not you have a fear of being eaten, this thing is definitely nightmare fuel. Even outside of its Gigantamax form, Gengar is a huge problem for my team, so stalling out its Gigantamax moves with Protect here isn't gonna do me much good, but at least we can get rid of one turn. Sadly, our special defense was still lowered, so this giant mouth of a Gengar will devour our fries. Rude. Gengar still has one G-Max turn left. We've lost two of our Pokemon, and Toracat is at one HP, so I'm kind of forced to swap in Ponyta here, even though we're at a massive type disadvantage. I do, however, somehow manage to survive a Max Darkness and fire off a Psybeam, doing about half to the Gengar. And even though that's fairly substantial damage and it's now out of Gigantamax turns, it still won't save Ponyta from an incoming Hex the next turn, losing now half of our team in this fight. After this, Kabu did show some mercy and felt like he'd done enough damage to the team, I guess, going for Spite, completely throwing the game and allowing me to take out Gengar with a Stomping Tantrum from Larvitar, granting us the third gym badge. And with our team having been so thoroughly devastated, we're gonna need a fair few new encounters. Starting out, we've got this Grimnay Trap Inch with a special attack boosting nature, so the game is very much pushing me towards using a special attacking Flygon. I then head to the Stony Wilderness, where I pick up a Pokemon I've never used before, it's Heatmore. But not just any Heatmore, this thing has Desolate Land, making it both immune to water types and powering up those fire type moves. Then, since the level cap is 36, we can get a lot of our Pokemon to evolve, updating most of our team to Pupitar, Sceptile, Incineroar, Vibrava, and Hakamo-O, which makes makes us a lot better prepared for our next opponent, B, than we were for Kabu. She leads with the mythical Jirachi, but that's no match for Popcorn the Heatmore. Once we've set up the Desolate Land, there's no way that this Jirachi is going to be able to take a fire move as it just sets up a future sight, allowing us to take it out with a fire lash. Having that future sight to worry about is a bit of a nuisance, but the more immediate problem is this Stack Attack, threatening me with a Stab Rock type move, so I swap out into Taco the Pupitar. This way, I can resist the incoming Rock Slide, but without an Eviolite at this point in time, it actually does a lot of damage. But we can do a lot of damage in return the next turn with a quad effective Earthquake, even though Stack Attack as a defense is very stacked. Also, I'm very glad it went for that Atomize, since we would have been absolutely destroyed by Future Sight if it just did 11 points of damage, so I'm forced to swap out the next turn into Vibrava, who can also resist the Rock Slide, and even though it does a ton of damage too, we can outspeed the next turn, taking the Stack Attacka out with a super effective Earth Power. 
Then in comes Metagross, and even though we've got a really good matchup going on here with our ground type, we're at way too low health with Vibrava to fight a pseudo-legendary, so I swap out into Incineroar. I was kinda hoping to swap into a psychic move with immunity, but it just keeps going for takedown, allowing me to knock it out the next turn with a flamethrower, easy peasy. This leaves B with just one Pokemon, her Gigantamax Pokemon, which happens to be a Cinderace. And once again, we've got a big problem on our hands, because this thing does know a fighting type move, which means I'm definitely forced to swap out of Incineroar, and unfortunately, Nachos the Vibrava is gonna have to take the hit. The dream of special attacking Grimnay Flygon has been broken. In the process, this Cinderace has also gained an attack boost from Max Knuckle, which means it's gonna do a lot of damage, even with something like Max Strike, getting Popcorn down deep into the yellow before I can fire off a Horn Drill, which doesn't even take the Cinderace down into half before I'm destroyed by another Max Knuckle. This means we've lost a third of our team to this thing, and giving it two attack boosts in the process, but at least it's out of Dynamax turns. Now, you might think Sceptile's a pretty strange switch in here, but I actually have a Focus Sash on Sceptile, and because of the randomized TM learn set, Sceptile gets Scald, meaning that once our Sash allows us to survive on one HP, a Scald is gonna be enough to grant us the Gym Badge. The gap between the 4th and 5th gym fight in this game isn't very long, with only a level cap difference of 2 and 1 route in between, where I end up picking up a Tortuga. It's a pretty awesome fossil Pokemon you rarely get to use, but it doesn't evolve before the next gym, so we're probably gonna have to hunt down some more encounters. So I head to Route 6, where I never picked anything up, where I'm promptly assaulted by a Hitmonlee, so I guess that's what I get. And having Poison Touch on a Mon with Fake Out is actually pretty sick. Finally, I head back to the wild area to the southeast lake to pick up a Chin Chow that we can immediately evolve into Lantern. It even has Iron Barbs and a special attack boosting nature, something I'm very happy about. But one thing I'm not as happy about is thinking the fight versus Opal would be a piece of cake because of her gimmick, and then she shows me a freaking Palkia, which I expect is about the only Palkia she sees these days. And really, if she would have had pretty much any other lead than this huge throbbing pink legendary, we would have had a lot easier of a time being able to just farm the different boosts from her questions. This fight's pretty much a joke in the base game, since her lead Weezing only has Fairy Wind and Tackle, but unfortunately this Palkia has Stab Dragon Breath that doesn't do too much damage, but eventually manages to get a Paralysis. This means my Sceptile is now paralyzed at about half health with plus two speed, and after this question at the end of the turn, plus two special defense and defense. I'm not even sure if this is a winning or losing position. While my Sceptile is super boosted, it's also very nerfed. Either way, after a few turns, I managed to take out the Palkia with neutral Giga Drains, giving me a beast boost to further boost my speed. Opal then sends in Galarian Moltres, but with my defense boost, I figure I can probably take a hit, stay in, and unfortunately get fully paralyzed as it sets up its own speed to now be faster than me. This shouldn't technically be a problem, since we can probably still take a hit since it didn't do any damage. However, since it's faster and using Air Slash, we of course get paraflinched. Staying in here would be giving up my Sceptile, so I'm forced to swap out, and with that, I give up all the potential gimmick boosts from the Opal fight. On the bright side of things, Pupitar does have an Eviolite now, meaning its defenses are greatly boosted, and we still take a ton of damage from Sucker Punch before, of course, missing a Rock Slide. Luckily, we have enough health to just barely survive another Sucker Punch, and this time connect with Rock Slide, doing over half, but we're now at risk of being taken out, so we've gotta switch out once again, this time sending in Lantern. At least we can swap in Lantern for free since it tries to go for Sucker Punch once again and then finish off the Moltres with a Dazzling Gleam. Opal then sends in her third Pokemon, this time a Mars Shadow, and much like Calyrex, I've never faced this thing before, so I don't know what it does, but based on this interaction, I'm not convinced that this thing is a great Pokemon at all since after going for Roleplay and stealing my Iron Barbs, it just continues trying to go for Roleplay, allowing me to just take it out in a couple more Dazzling Gleams. I have no idea why the AI does this and gets fixed on a certain move, but at least we only have the Gigantamax Pokemon left, Opals being a very fitting big kitty, which we of course have zero problems dealing with, granting us the fifth gym badge. I've got a few errands to run in Hammerlock. Care to join me for the journey? Ooh, I'm not really looking to be a sugar baby, but maybe you should ask Bead.
Heading towards Surchester, we pass through a couple routes, first of which being Route 7, where I pick up a Combuskin, followed immediately by Route 8, where I find a Lampent that I can also evolve into Chandelure right away. We can also evolve Tortuga into Caracosta, making us ready to face the sixth gym leader, Gordy. The man starts out with the Ultra Beast Celesteela, which doesn't work out for him since I start out with Incineroar and can completely torch the thing after he hits me with a soft flash cannon. And with one down, my reign of type matchups doesn't stop up there as he sends in a Mewtwo, and figuring that this thing usually only has psychic moves in its moveset, I just stay in and go for Darkest Lariat as it sets up a safeguard. This ends up doing a lot of damage, but is a lot less safe than I initially thought, because the next turn, Mewtwo shows me Aura Sphere, which I guess it gets by level up in this game. Luckily, it decided to go for that the second turn, however, giving us the chance to take it out with yet another Darkest Lariat. Third is Gordy's Salamence. Great, I'm gonna swap out of my Tiger into Pizza of the Caracosta, who, upon evolving, now has Grassy Surge, which actually works out pretty well here since Salamence is in the sky, and we're gonna get health back at the end of the turn after we take a bit of damage from Dragon Claw. And it seems like Dragon Claw is Salamence's most effective option here, which isn't doing too much damage, while we can do a ton of damage with a Stab Rock Slide and get health back at the end of the turn. Meaning another Dragon Claw won't be enough to take us out, and we do manage to land the somewhat dubiously accurate Rock Slide. Lastly, Gordy's got his Gigantamax Pokemon left, showing us Inteleon. And because we're in the red, we go down to any Gigantamax move that this thing uses, so I swap out into Lantern, as it of course Gigantamaxes, hitting me with Max Flutterby. It is a bit of a pain that that lowers our special attack, so we won't do as much damage with our Discharge the next turn, however, at least it doesn't lower any of our defenses, so we can take more hits. The next of which being Max Darkness, which does lower our special defense, however, it's coming off of a Sucker Punch, meaning that it's a physical max darkness. This way, the next max darkness doesn't actually do any more damage, and we're left at 13 HP, just barely surviving all of the Gigantamax turns. Unfortunately, we don't get a paralysis in the process of firing off our two discharges, so I'm forced to swap out the next turn, this time into Sceptile. I'm hit with a Liquidation on the switch, and Liquidation has a chance to lower defense, which it unfortunately gets, and I am very afraid of a U-turn from this thing, which I would have probably survived. However, I might as well go for the safe option. Option, swapping into Hitmonlee who can resist it, and with a Choice Scarf, outspeed the next turn, take out the Inteleon with a close combat to claim our sixth gym badge. Wow, the Fallout guy really let himself go. With Spike Myth in my sight, I quickly defeat Hop, make some more terrible financial decisions, and defeat Marnie. Which means I gain enough experience to reach level 45 and finally evolve Hakamoo into Kamoo. And this thing with Contrary could be absolutely nuts because, well, let me just show you. All you need to know is that Contrary is an ability that makes it so that any stat boost you get becomes a stat drop, and any stat drop becomes a boost. This is a ridiculous ability since it makes any move that punishes you by lowering your stats an unfair advantage engine. And Kamoo gets one of those moves when it evolves in Clanging Scales, which now boosts our defense. Zero Aura even realizes it's going to be doing less damage with Slash than a resisted Volt Switch, so it swaps out into Landorus. But we of course continue spamming Clanging Scales to further boost our defense. In fact, we're just faster than Landorus so that little maneuver cost Piers his Landorus and just gave us plus three defense. Piers then sends back in Zero Aura, and his strategy here is to go for Charge to boost his special defense and this way survive a Clanging Scale, which he does successfully. But this is a terrible strategy for him, since it further boosts my defense and just delays the inevitable. Since he's not going to be doing any more damage by stalling with Charge, and he's just going to get me to plus 5 defense by letting me take him out with another Clanging Scales. Third out is Piers' Feromosa, which is a good deal faster and manages to get a flinch with Stomp. The next Stomp, however, doesn't flinch me and I go for a Dragon Claw, which doesn't quite do half. Piers, however, is determined to have me take out Feromosa this turn since he goes for Lunge, which normally lowers your attack, but in this case, of course, boosts my attack because of Contrary, allowing me to take Feromosa out this turn. He then reveals that his final Pokemon is Dragapult, but because we're at plus five defense, it's not gonna be doing anything with that double hit, and we can easily take it out to claim our seventh gym badge. I believe I sufficiently made my case for Contrary. But even with such a powerful ability on our team, I would say we're in massive trouble, since double battle gyms are notoriously difficult. And with Raihan guaranteed to have a team full of legendaries, well, we're just gonna have to do our best. And let's just say I didn't exactly feel radiant with confidence when he threw out Thunderous and Kyogre. Look, at least his Kyogre doesn't have Drizzle, so we're in the clear. You have got to be kidding me! Not only does this make Thunder 100% accurate, it also boosts up Water-type moves. I'll be honest, I have no great options 
options here. Thunderous completely destroys my Caracosta with a 100% accurate Thunder, and as if that wasn't bad enough, the Kyogre goes for a rain-boosted stab Muddy Water, which of course destroys Blaziken. So if you've ever been looking for a tutorial on how to lose a third of your team on the very first turn of a battle, look no further than my YouTube channel. The only good thing to come out of this is we can hit the Kyogre with an Energy Ball from my Scarf Chandelure and follow that up with another Energy Ball from my Sceptile, meaning we can at least get rid of the Kyogre and get a speed boost for Sceptile from Beast Boost in the process. Thunderous then does a massive amount of damage versus Chandelure with Thunder, but because we have Cursed Body, we actually manage to disable it. Ryan then shows me another Lord of the Ocean, Lugia, which I'm just really hoping doesn't have Hydro Pump. And since I'm locked into Energy Ball, which isn't effective against either of his Pokemon, I swap out into Incineroar and hit Lugia with a Shadow Ball from Sceptile. Unfortunately, Lugia targets Sceptile with this extra sensory since we would have dodged it with immunity on Incineroar. Thunderous just lowers its own speed with a Hammer Arm at the end of the turn, so the next I can fire off another Shadow Ball, hoping for that special defense drop and not getting it as Lugia almost recovers back to full with a recover. To further humiliate my Sceptile, it gets knocked out by a Thrash. I can't really think of a worse way to go. And to cap off the turn, at least I can do quite a lot of damage with a Darkest Lariat. It makes sense to send in Chandelure here since we're both immune to Thrash and can take out the Lugia with a Scarf Shadow Ball. From there, the Thunderous tries to hit me with a Thrash, but it ends up targeting Chandelure, which works out perfectly since we're immune and can can hit it with the Darkest Lariat for over half damage. This then reveals Raihan's Gigantamax Pokemon, a Snorlax, which is pretty terrible since we can't hit it at all with Shadow Ball, which Chandelure is locked into because of Scarf. Before I have to switch Chandelure out though, I can use my Scarf Shadow Ball to my advantage to take out the Thunderous and not have to deal with that thing anymore. I then hit Snorlax with a Darkest Lariat, which does way less damage than I was expecting, and a super effective Max Knuckle takes Ratatouille down below half. This is pretty bad for two reasons. It gives Snorlax an attack boost, and we have to swap out Chandelure here if we ever want to do any damage with it, meaning we have to stay in with Incineroar. I do get very lucky this turn, however. After a critical hit Darkest Lariat, Max Quake doesn't take out Incineroar, instead hitting Chips for less than half damage. The next turn, I can use a Clanging Scales to do a bit of damage to the Snorlax and boost my Kamoa's defense. I then do some more pathetic damage with Darkest Lariat before Incineroar's time has come, and it gets taken out by another Max. Max Knuckle. This means we've officially lost two thirds of our team and I have to send in my final Pokemon Chandelure. But at least Snorlax Dynamax turns are finally over and we can finish it off with a Scarf Psy Shock from Chandelure, granting us the eighth gym badge, just at a very high cost. Luckily, we had enough Pokemon in the box to fully replenish our team, but now we don't have any backups and we're about to face the Pokemon League, which is gonna be the strongest of the strong opponents in the entire game. So I begin by heading down the beaten path on Route 10 where I pick up an Agron. An absolute beast of a Pokemon with an amazing adamant nature and one of the best abilities in Nuzlocke's battle armor. Then since we're running out of areas to find encounters, I head over to the Isle of Armor, where I run into a Lickitung, which is huge. No, I'm not shaming it for its size, shame on you. Now this thing literally has huge power. And as a final act of preparation, I evolve the Shellgun I found on Route 9 into Salamence. And so with my new epic team, I was ready to head to Wind and to take on the Pokemon League. And to begin with, I was hugely successful. You see, Hop, Marnie, and Bead aren't gym leaders, so they're not guaranteed to have any of those legendaries. And so beating the three of them mercilessly gave me a very false sense of confidence, especially considering what's to come, oh boy. You see, my first real Pokemon League opponent was Nessa. And unlike last time when her strategy mostly blew up in her face, this time she starts out strong with a Xerneas. Hitmonlee is very weak to this thing, but I do start out with a fake out and get a poison touch just in case this thing has something like sturdy before I swap out. I send in my scarf chandelure here as the Xerneas just sets up misty terrain. I then start firing off shadow balls and while Nessa uses a couple of forward stores, eventually the Xerneas falls. With one big threat out of the way, Nessa sends in her second Pokemon, Tyranitar. We're locked into Shadow Ball here, which Tyranitar resists, so we definitely have to swap out, and I decide to send in Swedish Fish. And the Tyranitar goes for a Stone Edge, which does way over half. I then do what I should have done in the first place and swap out into Hitmonlee, who would have just resisted the Stone Edge, but now has to take a neutral Earthquake. 
We do have a guaranteed KO with close combat, but just to be sure, I end up going for a fake out here once again getting the poison just to ensure that we don't have to deal with something like Sturdy and get taken out before I take out Tyranitar with a close combat. This leads Nessa to her third Pokemon, a Zacian, but it's not actually its crown form, instead the weird sausage form. Turns out at this level, Zacian doesn't have a great moveset to deal with Chandelure, its best move being Iron Head, which does do a bit of damage, but not quite enough for it to take us out before we destroy it with Shadow Balls. Fourth out, Nessa has a Tapu Koko, which also at this level has a pretty pathetic moveset and no fairy move, so we're completely safe to swap into Kamoa, who can easily take it out with a couple of ice punches. This just leaves Nessa with her Gigantamax Pokemon, Gengar, giving us a chance to get revenge against this thing. First of all, we now have a normal type we can switch into, so the first G-Max Terror does absolutely nothing. It then swaps it up, going for Max Darkness, barely doing any damage at all, but lowering our special defense. Not a problem for huge power Licky Licky, however, who can't quite take out the Gengar with a drill run, but a second does the trick, granting us the victory. Leading us into our second Elite Four fight, the rematch versus B, who much like Nessa comes in blazing hot with a Galarian Zapdos. I do have kind of the upper hand, however, with Scarf Chandelure, able to hit for over half of the Psy Shock. The problem being that after doing over half of the drill pack, Zapdos gets a speed boost. This means it's no longer just a free KO. Oh, next turn, so I'm forced to swap out, sending in Lantern on the next drill pack. B then annoyingly goes for a full restore, meaning that my discharge doesn't quite do enough to take it out, but still taking the Zapdos below half health. I really don't have a switch here, so I'm forced to stay in on a close combat, surviving on just 6 HP. This even activates a bit of chip iron barbs damage before I can finish off the Zapdos with discharge, and I am incredibly happy we don't have to deal with that thing anymore. What I'm not so psyched about, however, is that she's got a ho oh. Obviously, we'd be taken out if we stay in against this thing, so I'm forced to swap out into Licky Licky as the Ho-Oh hits me with a move I've never even seen before, Burn Up, which does a massive amount of damage and consumes its fire typing, and I really don't have a great switch in here, so I just decide to stay in to try and do some damage as the Ho-Oh charges up a Sky Attack. This lets me get off a Thunder Punch, which does a bit less than I was hoping for. I really don't want to lose my pal Licky Licky here, so I decide to swap out, sending in Salamence, because it's probably the only thing that stands any chance at all of surviving this Sky Attack, and even that's dubious. Fortunately, we do manage to survive, and even more fortunately, I connect with a rock slide, taking out the ho -Oh. And if I didn't have a Licky Licky of my own, I wouldn't know that this thing has huge power and what a massive threat it is. However, I am expecting it to use a normal move, so I can pivot into Chandelure to dodge it with my Ghost type before swapping out once again, now expecting a dark move into Drumstick. This will knock off my Expert Belt, but at least I get to survive, and since Licky Licky is so slow, we can outspeed it the next turn, go for a fake out just for some extra damage, and take it out after that with a close combat. Combat. Now, while we haven't lost any Pokemon to be, she's done a lot of damage to most of our team members. So when she showed me Volcanion, a Pokemon with an incredibly annoying typing to deal with, I knew I was going to have to make a sacrifice. And while I'm sure there's plenty of you in the audience that would be elated at the idea of B stepping on you, I don't think this is what you had in mind. Now that I can switch chips in for free, I decide to go for a Drain Punch, not really knowing how fast Volcanion is, which ends up backfiring since I'm actually faster. Luckily, it doesn't get a burn with Scald, and after looking up its stats, I realize its special defense is much worse, so I can take it out with a Clanging scales and boost my defense in the process. This just leaves B with her Gigantamax Pokemon, Charizard, which is a lot more threatening than you think, even though we can resist its G-Max Wildfire. I once again boost my defense with Clanging Scales, but G-Max Wildfire is going to hit me on the special side, not for too much damage, but the damage over time effect is fairly substantial, at least enough to where I definitely want to swap out to not lose Kamoo next turn, sending in Toast. And Toast can resist the hit, also being unaffected by the damage over time effect, allowing it to outspeed the next turn with a Choice Scarf, doing a bit of damage with a Shadow Ball before, unfortunately, it too has to go down. I send back in Salamence, since Charizard's G-Max turns are finally over, and it's gonna have to do one more risky Rock Slide push, which very fortunately connects, and though we lost two Pokemon, seals the victory. Which means we need to add both our boxed Pokemon, Agron and Pupitar, to the team, and we can even evolve Pupitar into Tyranitar. Last time we faced Raihan, it was the most devastating fight of the run, and he's no less threatening, starting out with a Rayquaza. I, however, lead with my tankiest Pokemon, Agron, so even though Rayquaza sets up 
up a Dragon Dance, I'm pretty sure I could take a physical hit from it. Not only that, my Aggron has Ice Punch, since a lot of legendaries are Dragon, but it isn't quite enough to take Rayquaza out, so Raihan heals it up with a full restore. This is pretty much a wasted move, since another Ice Punch just takes Rayquaza back into the red, and then Raihan completely throws his Rayquaza to the wayside by going for another Dragon Dance, allowing me to just take it out for free with another Ice Punch. Second out is Virizion, and I'm really not looking to be taken out by a quad effective Sacred Sword, so I swap out into Salamence, which can resist it with its flying typing. I then hit it with a Dragon Claw, which isn't quite enough to take it below half, but Virizion helps me up a bit, going for a takedown, and the recoil actually gets it below half. Another Dragon Claw still isn't enough to take it out, but Virizion goes for takedown again, being an absolute bro and taking itself out. Oh boy, non-slow start Reggie Gigas is a problem. I'm really not ready to sacrifice my Salamence, so I go ahead and swap out into my best defense sponge, Agron, who can very easily tank a resisted Mega Punch. What I did not expect is Reggie Gigas having Body Press, doing a massive amount of damage, but we're still able to survive and fire off an Iron Head. Now, unfortunately, there's nothing on my team that wants to take this Body Press, and Agron is gonna have to take one for the team in its very first fight. This gives us a free switch into Licky Licky, who I'm hoping can take one move from this thing, managing to tank a Mega Punch fairly well, and then take out the Reggie Gigas with a Choice Band Huge Power Brick Break. Once again, Tapu Koko isn't that big a threat, and we can easily just swap in Tyranitar and take it out with a couple of Earthquakes, leaving Raihan only with his Dynamax Pokemon, Corviknight. Which doesn't pose too much of a problem since we can just barely edge out all of its Dynamax moves with Tyranitar. Then since we're so low on health, we need to swap out into our only Pokemon with full health, Chips. And we are taking a bit of a risk here since this Brave Bird would definitely take me out if it were a critical hit. However, it doesn't end up getting it and the recoil isn't quite enough to take Corviknight out, but we can outspeed and take it out the following turn with an Ice Punch. Now I know we urgently need to save the world, but we don't have a full team, so I head to Axew's Eye to pick up a Venusaur. Evil as ever, Rose wants to flatten the Gala region by unleashing Dynamax Pokemon. And with his Intimidate Groudon, which would normally be an insane ability, he actually just ends up boosting Kamo'o's attack through Contrary. Kamo'o has also now learned Close Combat, even more OP than Clanging Scales, since it boosts both our Special Defense and Defense. And at plus one defense, not even an Earthquake from Groudon does very much damage, some of which we can heal back up with Leftovers. I'm then free to fire off another plus one Close Combat, taking out the Groudon and further boosting my defenses. But Rose isn't out of it yet, sending in a Dialga with Dauntless Shield, boosting its defense. Something that plus one Kamoo completely laughs off, taking it out with one single close combat and further boosting our defenses. It then seems Rose has captured his beloved Eternatus, which is faster than Chips, but because we're at plus three special defense, a Dragon Pulse doesn't do very much damage, and we can fire back with an Ice Punch, doing way over half. Rose then fishes for a poison with cross poison, but doesn't end up getting it, allowing us to finish off Eternatus with another Ice Punch. We then get a little bit bamboozled as he sends in a Blissey, and I'm thinking, great, we can just recover back all of our health by using Drain Punch to guarantee we get everything back, but Blissey has Aftermath, meaning it takes some of our health with it, and Rose is now only left with his final Pokemon, Gigantamax Mel Metal. And while it's pretty cool, awesome, and in theme for Rose to have, I couldn't have asked for a better matchup. Plus one close combat isn't enough to take it out, but we get even more defenses, and as it hits me with a max strike, it even boosts our speed. Thanks, Melmetal. And so, with another plus one close combat, we destroy Melmetal, and with it, Rose's plans of, well, whatever they are. Meaning that there's only one thing standing in our way of becoming the Galar champion to take on champion Leon himself. It's my full team of six versus his, which is probably gonna be stacked full of crazy legendaries like Shiny Genesect. I start out with Kamoo, hoping that we can maybe pull off something crazy again. And to my surprise, I actually outspeed the Genesect, but it surprises me even more by going for self-destruct. Not exactly what I expected, but with our defense boost, it barely does any damage at all. Things get slightly more problematic, however, when Leon shows me Necrozma, which I don't have any good moves to hit. Duskmane Necrozma is very strong, but expecting a psychic move from it, we can switch into the Dark-type Tyranitar to be completely immune. It'll then have to rely on its other moves like Power Jam, which aren't too reliable against Tyranitar, and we can do massive damage with Crunch. And after a second Power Jam, another Crunch does the trick, taking out the Duskmane Necrozma, which makes space for a somehow even scarier Pokemon, Zygarde Complete 
platform. And I don't like the idea of switching anything into this thing, so Tyranitar, unfortunately, to make way for a safe switch, is gonna have to take one for the team. This way we can get Licky Licky in for free, who I really hope can take a hit. A lot's hinging on this Licky Licky, and luckily, we survive it fairly well, able to take out the Zygarde with a choice band huge power ice punch. Unfortunately, we're far from out of trouble, since Leon of course would have a shiny Rayquaza. We're in a very bad spot and we need a safe switch here, so Licky Licky is gonna have to make the ultimate sacrifice. But at least she died the way she lived, with her tongue out. This is a very important sacrifice since we can now send in Choice Scarf Salamence. And I don't have much of a choice but to lock myself into Outrage to finish off the Rayquaza. Leon then sends in his fifth Pokemon, Curem, which is perfect since Outrage will outspeed and take it out, but it's got Intimidate. And while we can still outspeed with our Choice Scarf, because of that attack nerf, we don't have quite enough to take it out, meaning Salamence gets absolutely destroyed by a blizzard. With half of our team gone, it's getting down to the wire, and I know I only have one option to beat this thing. There's no way that Hitmonlee can outspeed this thing, but we can survive on one HP with a Focus Sash and that way take out the Curum with a close combat. I was also actually expecting to lose Hitmonlee to Sandstorm here, however, luckily the Sandstorm subsides. And Leon shows me his final Pokemon, it's a Pikachu. This is overwhelmingly good news. Well, definitely not for Hitmonlee, since Pikachu is faster and definitely capable of taking out its remaining 4 HP. Now, the great news is that both of our remaining Pokemon can resist Pikachu's Electric-type moves and stall out its Dynamax turns and full restores, and strike back with powerful moves like Outrage to guarantee our victory. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I beat a Pokemon Sword Randomizer Hardcore Nuzlocke. It really came down to the wire, but the most important thing to take from this video is that if you don't subscribe, I'm giving your number to Opal.